Join me this year at Exosphere, the alternative education platform where unique learning experiences cultivate the discipline, knowledge, and curiosity for building new enterprises that solve real problems. Its second boot camp, designed to accommodate people from all stages of life with a diversity of experience and ideas, happens from March to June 2014 in Santiago, Chile. I'll be there as a full-time fellow, as well as a whole faculty and residence with experience in coding, design, development, marketing, and emerging technology to help you develop your business and yourself. You can find more details and apply at exosphe.re until January 15th. Season 4 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, Polar Inertia, a journal of nomadic and popular culture online at polarinertia.com, and Medivate, a community and set of tools to help you build the kind of meditation practice you'd like to have online at medivate.com. Thomas, is it possible to know Copenhagen without knowing its serving houses? Oh, that's a a very difficult question for me. Uh, I think uh, that it is necessary to know the 1,525 serving houses of Copenhagen uh, to know Copenhagen. Um, obviously, I do not know all 1,525 of them uh, yet, but uh, that is my life's project. <laughs> This is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down in the very center of Copenhagen with Thomas E. Kennedy, an American novelist who has lived in Copenhagen 20, 30, 20, 37 years. He is now, he has written a quartet of novels about the city, the Copenhagen Quartet, now being published in the U.S. and the U.K. They are falling sideways in the company of angels. Um, Garrigan in Copenhagen, in Copenhagen, indeed, and soon to come, Beneath the Neon Egg. The Serving Houses make an important part of Kerrigan in Copenhagen, because this is a book whose form, it's not in the form of guidebook to the Serving Houses, but it is, it, it follows the creation of a guidebook to the Serving Houses. You've said before this is, this is almost an experimental form, is it not? Yes, uh, I think of it as uh, an experimental form, and I wanted uh, all of the four books to be uh, independent of each other and to be written in a different style. Uh, the first book uh, in the Company of Angels is a kind of a uh, a book with a, a novel with a sh social conscience. Uh, the second book, Falling Sideways, is uh, uh, something of a satire about a downsizing uh, Danish company and and the third book uh, I wanted to be um, experimental uh, a novel in the disguise of a uh, of a guidebook to uh, Copenhagen serving houses you have different forms you explore different aspects of Copenhagen and as well, you you explore different, I would almost say different nationalities, different kinds of people. You've mentioned that in, in The Company of Angels, you have the one book you've written without a single American character. How did you come to that point as an American where you could write a novel with no Americans in it? I sort of dove into the water, uh, I guess. You knew you were writing an American-less novel. Yes. Uh, well, I didn't know, uh, actually, when I started it. I only thought that the main character would be a Chilean uh, torture survivor being treated here in the uh, torture rehabilitation center. Uh, but quickly, uh, a Danish woman took over uh, the central consciousness of the novel and uh, no Americans appeared. Um, I, I don't think any Americans appeared, but I, I never know when I'm writing a novel uh, who the characters will be uh, or 
who might uh, be introduced? Let's go back a little bit for the listener who doesn't know the history of the publication of these books. I mentioned they're now being published, this quartet, in the U.S. and the U.K., but these these already exist. They've been published in, was it, was it Ireland that they've already been published in? Yes, uh, they were uh, published in Ireland by a uh, relatively small uh, publisher. I uh, was given a, uh, a guide to the serving houses, oh, to 100 serving houses of Copenhagen. A small subset. Yes, uh, in 1998 uh, for a Christmas gift. And, uh, and I immediately decided that I wanted to visit every one of those hundred serving houses. And then I thought, and I invited my uh, girlfriend along with me at the time, and, um, and I thought, wow, what a wonderful novel idea it would be to uh, have a main character who's writing about serving houses and uh, writing about selecting the hundred best serving houses of Copenhagen. And, uh, and, and then it sort of took off from there. Mm. You can indeed, the reader can, use Kerrigan and Copenhagen as a guide to serving houses. It actually, it works for that purpose, though, though it's not set up like that, right? Uh, it, it's not set up like that. Uh, although uh, one salesman for Bloomsbury uh, told me that uh, he had toured Copenhagen just uh, visiting the serving houses in Kerrigan. Um, oh, and he went and he followed the, the Kerrigan serving houses. He did. He did the Kerrigan tour. Yes, he did the <laughs> Kerrigan tour, and uh, he said he had a very good time. No, no doubt. How, how could you not? <laughs> I would imagine, um, once again, let's go over the, the order of these novels. First of all, what, what order have they come out in in this, this edition from Bloomsbury, and what order should they ideally be read in? Well, they can be read in any order. Uh, you know, the, there's, uh, they're independent of each other, and uh, there are different characters uh, in them. So, uh, you know, I thought it would be uh, too much to require the reader to read four novels. Um, so... Um, they can be read in any order, and uh, uh, actually, uh, there's no ideal order. Uh, the Irish publication of the books uh, had uh, Kerrigan and Copenhagen first, uh, had um, Blewett's Blue Hours, which is uh, beneath the knee on egg. Still to come out in, for the U.S. and the U.K. In the, in the U, uh, U.S. But what, 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 uh, what date does it have for publication, just so listeners know? Uh, well, um, it, the uh, American publication, uh, it will be in August 2014. Ah, that's beneath the, a little while to wait. Beneath the knee and egg. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's a famous... Uh, uh, Advertisement: uh, a neon sign on uh, a north side lake of Copenhagen uh, for Ema uh, eggs. Yes. Yeah. And they seem to be a, a well-known market here as well, Ema, right? Yes, uh, an upscale market actually. Yes, I've been buying presents for people from there. You know, <laughs> no place like an upscale grocery store for good presents to take back. I, I find out of what you find. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> These novels. I feel like Kerrigan and Copenhagen is one to recommend as the first because that gives you such an idea of the layout of the city, of what's around, because it's so rich with de physical details. I mean, you're, people say about, about uh, Ulysses, and you could remap the Dublin of the time just by reading the, the uh, book. You could reconstruct the city itself. I feel like Kerrigan and Copenhagen, it's, it gives you... How much did you want to work in of the layout of the city, of the real physical reality of what Copenhagen is? Well, I wanted to um, cover as much as I could of Danish culture, Danish uh, geography, uh, uh, Copenhagen geography, um, uh, the literature, 
the language, uh, of course, the serving houses. And, um, you know, I wanted to cover in all four books the light of the four seasons uh, because each book, uh, each novel takes place in a different uh, season. And, you know, what captured me uh, most about uh, Copenhagen the first time I visited was the light here. Everybody mentions the light, that it's Copenhagen experience more than I am. They say, oh, the light, the golden girls and the golden light. What, what is it about the light? In the summer, the sun comes up uh, around 3 o'clock in the morning or a little before 3, and the birds start to sing uh, before 3 o'clock in the morning. And uh, it remains light until 10 o'clock at night, uh, more or less. Uh, you know, the, the sky remains light. Uh, the, the, uh, the earth begins to darken. Uh, and in winter, you have the opposite situation. Uh, you have uh, the sun uh, coming up around 9 o'clock uh, in the morning. Uh, between 9 and 10 in the morning and uh, going down at uh, 4 in the afternoon and uh, you only have a, a gloomy light uh, between 10 and 4 in the afternoon and but you know actually the autumn is uh, a special light too uh, which captured me. Uh, I visited the first time in September in 1972, and uh, and somehow the light captivated me. And I am uh, deuced if I can, uh, you know, uh, describe the light in September. But I I loved it. I loved it. And I I thought to myself. I will live here. Mm. You've mentioned in previous conversations we've had how instantaneously Copenhagen captured you, made you decide you would live here. How, how long was it before you actually could live here? I started uh, working on uh, my transplantation to Copenhagen from New York in uh, 1972. I was working at the moment, uh, at the at the time, uh, for a um, uh, the World Medical Association, and they had offered me a job in France uh, uh, from 1974, and uh, and I thought, well, France is closer to uh, Copenhagen than New York is. It was all about proximity to Copenhagen. Exactly. So I uh, went and lived in uh, France for two years uh, in a little town called uh, Fernet Voltaire, mm. which is just across the uh, border from uh, Geneva, mm. uh, Switzerland. And, uh, and there I met a Danish professor who uh, offered me a job, uh, more or less the same job that I was doing for the World Medical Association, but uh, in Copenhagen for the Danish Medical Association. Mm. And uh, I immediately uh, accepted. Wow, oh, yes. You, you would be in the city that, that you loved. And it turned out to really, you know, this wasn't just a, an infatuation. This really was the city that you would love, was it not? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I have never regretted, well, you know, I regretted um, the third year that I was here because I uh, was still learning the language, but um, basically I have never regretted uh, moving here, and I've always loved it. Yeah. Now, as you say, you had a good job that was not fiction writing. This whole time, were you thinking, well, I'm really a fiction writer? Inside, I'm doing this other job, but did you feel like this was this was the calling, writing novels that was that you were answering only on your off hours? Well, I decided when I was 17 years old that all I wanted to do in the world, in in my life, was to to be a writer. I realized that uh, I had to get a job to pay the rent and to to feed myself. And uh, it took a long time uh, to publish anything. 
you know, I had encouragement. I had an agent. Uh, I had uh, many professors who uh, believed in me. Uh, but uh, I did not get anything published for 20 years until I had moved to Copenhagen. Uh, but I wrote and kept writing. And um, Your breakthrough as a fiction writer seems to only have come after you left your own country. Is that true? Exactly. Uh, you know, that's wh where I was trying to go. Uh, you know, I, actually, I think uh, it was not until I was able to view uh, my American culture through the lens of a new culture that I uh, began to write things that were... Um, acceptable uh, to acceptable. <laughs> acceptable to American publishers. I see. It's a fascinating thing because in the Copenhagen Quartet, as well as your other books, and there are many others, you write many Danish characters. When in your life did you start to feel comfortable writing a Danish character? Well, it took uh, about 20 years here. Um, you know, um, I was terrified uh, of um, writing uh, a Danish character and writing uh, uh, a novel set in a Danish background uh, because um, I didn't think that I understood it well enough. Um, but, you know, after 20 years, I decided that, well, you know, I've... I'm finished uh, reinterpreting uh, experiences I've had in Denmark into an American setting. Also, uh, I had been away for so long that uh, I wasn't sure that I was getting it right. Well, you'd still be writing about the America of 1970 or whatever. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which is an interesting America, but not yeah. the current one. The, the mid-70s. Yeah actually and um, I decided that uh, I would write uh, uh, a Danish novel and um, actually I wrote one before Kerrigan uh, Kerrigan in Copenhagen uh, I wrote uh, actually the the n novel that's about to be published in 19, uh, in 2014 beneath the neon egg listen. yes and uh, I had written that in 1996, and um, it's vastly uh, edited now and changed. This has given you the opportunity authors dream of, which is revising your older works. Almost no one gets that. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's very true. Uh, and, you know, I wrote the first book in winter because... Winter was um, very special for me in Copenhagen. You know, it's it's almost a black and black and white world, uh, and then suddenly you see a little bit of color. Uh, you know, you see uh, the green of a pine tree. Um, uh, you see the blue of a a woman's. A woolen coat. Mm. Uh, you see the blonde of a hair, uh, the blue of an eye. Um, but, uh, you know, it's almost strictly a black and white world. So that, that was the first uh, book that I wrote. But the second book that I wrote, uh, Kerrigan, uh, in Copenhagen, uh, I wanted to fill it with all that I had learned in those 20 years of uh, Danish culture, Danish habits, uh, Danish serving houses, Danish food, Danish beer, Danish literature, uh, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, that's probably, uh, you know, I think, Colin, uh, that you uh, suggested that Kerrigan is a good place to start. Maybe it is. <laughs> in those first few years you had in Copenhagen as a resident, when did things, what things started striking you as like, oh, this is different, this is different from what I'm used to? You mentioned Danish habits, Danish ways, Danish ways of thinking. What, what were some of the things that struck you as being different? 
Oh. Well, uh, certainly the food was different. Uh, the culture was very different. Um, I mean, for example, when you go to a party in Copenhagen or to a dinner, uh, people are kind of formal and stiff at uh, at the start, and you uh, you kind of shake hands with everyone in the room. But you know, you're you're kind of uh, uh, feeling out of place, and and it seems that everyone is feeling out of place. And then you sit down, and uh, typically uh, a Danish host or hostess will uh, uh, place you at the table, you know, with uh, even with a name card. <laughs> and uh, and then you will sit down, and you'll um, wait for the host or hostess to uh, make the first skull, the first toast. And uh, and then it goes much more quickly. <laughs> oh, yes. After the formalities. Yes. It's it's fascinating that as well you I'm thinking of especially in a book like Falling Sideways, where there are mostly Danish characters. You also introduce Danish characters who not that they criticize the Danish way of life, but that they know how to game the Danish way of life. They know where the holes are. Uh, I think specifically of uh, this, this, this CEO character in Falling Sideways who famously, you know, in America, we think of, oh, the maternity leave they have over there. Oh, the, they, all these benefits they get. Society takes care of its citizens. The CEO is able to almost supernaturally sense, you know, when his secretary might be pregnant so he can get rid of her before he has to give her the Danish year of maternity leave. You know, when did you feel comfortable not just writing Danish characters, but writing Danish characters who look at the, f not the faults, but they criticize or or play their own system, if you know what I mean. When I began to understand the system... Um, what is the system here, by the way? How do you describe it? Uh, well, uh, that would... It would require a reading of all four of my novels of the yes. Copenhagen Quartet, I, I think, to yes. understand that or to, you know, to explain that. Right. Where I made my breakthrough was uh, when I became a the head of a department in the company that I worked for. Mm. And then I had to attend every Tuesday morning a uh, management meeting. Mm. And there were about six or eight people uh, uh, chaired by the director. Uh, and... They had no uh, agenda and no time limits on this meeting. And I hated to be there. And I hated to be there, but at the same time, I realized that I had to be there because, you know, otherwise, you know, people would talk about me and say, you know, he doesn't. Uh, get up early and work hard, you know, uh, right. and and things like that. These are like what we talk about happening in East Asia, in Japan or Korea. That you need to look like you're working very hard. Are you working hard? Doesn't matter so much. Look like you're working hard. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, I learned shorthand in the army, uh, which uh, I used to. Uh, make notes in the meetings, but make notes for fiction. Oh, I see. Uh, and no one could read what I was, uh, what, what I was writing. And, you know, so, someone once asked, do you write Arabic? <laughs> <laughs> shorthand looks a little bit like that, like yeah. the line, central line through it and all that. Exactly. And um, so I started uh, making notes about the people at the management meetings and uh, and then I made my breakthrough uh, you know for that falling sideways right, right, you know. right. sometimes I make notes to myself in Korean for the same reason nobody around me is going to read it uh, even though my Korean isn't very good but notes to self falling sideways is a corporate satire and 
you know, the Scandinavian corporate satire seems to... Rem- it's an unexplored genre, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a American corporate satire, there's a huge amount of it, uh, because nobody in America really likes working in a big company, and we, we all know the foibles. What, what about the way corporations are in Scandinavia seems so ripe for satire to you? Falling Sideways was not uh, particularly popular in uh, the United States, because I, but it was popular in the United Kingdom, and I think uh, you know the uh, the British uh, have a particular. Uh, taste for satire and corporate satire. Maybe when Mad Men was, uh, was uh, filmed for HBO, maybe they began to have, uh, uh, Americans began to have uh, um, a, a taste for corporate sat- satire. What is it in uh, Scandinavian culture that uh, is ripe for corporate satire. Well, I think the fact that um, you you sort of greet everyone in the room in order of rank. Uh, you know, and that was a, a German idea that was uh, uh, you know placed in my mind in my perceptions, but I realized that actually. Uh, it's a Scandinavian idea as well. And maybe it's an American idea, too. Uh, I don't know. An American would never acknowledge that. It might be an American idea. Yeah. I sort of uh, uh, got these... uh, uh, got this uh, kind of idea and, um, and, you know, took off from there. There's at the core of this as well, this, this sense that, as I say, in America... Some people are very envious of the Scandinavian system. You know, they'll say everybody is comfortable, everybody's content, year of maternity leave, uh, a generous retirement package, what have you. But in, you know, in Falling Sideways, there's this whole CEO character, or whatever his position is, his whole his whole mission is to fire people. I mean, it's it expresses this sense that, and I hear it from other people. I was talking to the novelist uh, Per Schmiedel, who you, whom you know this morning, uh, there's this, it's conveyed in your books in the quartet that not every Dane is perfectly satisfied with Denmark, are they not? I don't know uh, whether every Dane is satisfied with Denmark. There was a survey uh, two years running that had uh, Denmark as the happiest country in the world, uh, as you we can't forget. Yeah. And uh, most livable city, Copenhagen, often named that. Yeah. But uh, as somebody told me uh, recently that uh, there was another survey taken, uh, why was it, uh, why is it the happiest country in the world? And uh, the answer was low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> That'll get you happiness if nothing else will. Yeah. Does it, when you're writing Danish characters, is... Is that change in expectations? I won't say lowering, but is different expectations a major factor in the way you imagine a Danish character versus, say, an American or anybody else? I think that, uh, you know, in in the United States, you have the 1% and the 99%. Uh, in Denmark, you probably have, you know, the 30% and the 70%. Uh, something like that. The proportions change. Yeah, exactly. And um, I'm, I think that you can be happy here, um, or I can be happy here, uh, with less. Uh, you know, I don't require a, a McMansion. I don't require a, a, even an automobile. Uh, I have not had an automobile since 1996, and I haven't driven one since 1997. I, ha- I walk everywhere. I ride my bicycle. I uh, use the public transport system. Uh, 
which is excellent. Mm. Uh, and I understand that it's uh, developing uh, in uh, Los Angeles, too. Uh, Indeed. We're yeah. getting more and more train lines. I wonder, as an American, what what is so satisfying about Denmark from that perspective about what Denmark offers because a Dane might have gotten cynical if they've lived here 50 years and if that's their whole life they'll say oh you know it's not so great we've got the problems we've got the we've got some crime starting up we've got the tax system that's very aggressive but as an American what do you find is a relief or very satisfactory here that you didn't find back admittedly 40 years ago but back home when I left New York um, it was uh, not a very pleasant place to be. Uh, I think I told you about uh, my girlfriend who lived in Alphabet City in Manhattan. Were you there for Ford to City drop dead? Uh, I'm sorry? Were you there for Ford to City drop dead? Did you, were you there for that headline? Maybe you were already gone, but the famous Gerald Ford quote, uh, well, not quote, but uh, I believe the New York Post, Ooh. Ford to City, drop dead. That yeah. was in the 70s. Yeah. You know, and people mark that as the nadir of New York City. Somewhere in the 70s, New York City bottomed out. That was when you got out, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there was a lot of crime, a lot of drugs, uh, and, you know, the city was about to go bankrupt. And um, there were many uh, unpleasant things in in uh, New York City at the time and my uh, my girlfriend's neighbor uh, because her faucet was dripping uh, emptied a, a rifle through her door and uh, fortunately she was not hit uh, or her nephew was not hit uh, and they were standing right behind the door and you know I thought well you know I want to get out of here <laughs> that sense of seething anger seems to have been seems to have reached a boiling point in New York in, in New York in the 70s Copenhagen I do not associate with seething anger in any way no uh, certainly not uh, certainly not and um, you know you know, they've cleaned up, uh, Giuliani cleaned up uh, New York uh, somewhat, but he swept all of the problems uh, into the neighboring boroughs, I think. You know, uh, Roosevelt Avenue, where I grew up, uh, in Jackson Heights and uh, Corona and Elmhurst, is uh, a, a seething hellhole. Uh, of uh, sex trafficking, counterfeiting identities. To this day? Oh, yeah. There was a special in the New York Times uh, just uh, six months or a year ago uh, about uh, the counterfeiting of uh, green cards and social security cards and uh, the sex trafficking and uh, etc. After moving to Copenhagen, was there some point you decided you would be a European writer rather than a, a writer for America, necessarily? I don't uh, know how to answer that, because I, I still think of myself as an American writer, uh, but maybe I'm more of a mid-Atlantic writer or a Danish-American writer. or the best place to be in between. <laughs> um, I've been called an Irish-American writer, uh, but my mother was French. Uh, maybe I'm an uh, American-European writer. Uh, In any case, you get to position yourself between two different regions, and I wonder as well, being in another society that speaks a different language, where you have to learn another language, I mean, they speak English here, but you're not really in it unless you're speaking Danish. What does that give you as a writer in English, to know another language, to know another set of expressions. I mean, you, you use Danish expressions in translation, and many of them I remember, you know, particularly uh, to, to hang your pictures where your nails are. Uh, that's one that will stick with me. You know, what does, what does being in another language, living in another language, give you as a writer in your native language? Well, I, I think that, uh, you know, uh, and that... Uh, expression that you mentioned, uh, hanging your pictures where your nails are, um, 
I think uh, is one of my favorites. And I think that um, the idioms uh, are cliches here, but uh, very fresh to us. One man's cliche is another man's burst of insight. Exactly. Exactly. And, uh, you know, cliches become cliches for good reason, because they they are rich. And, uh, you know, when you think of uh, the expressions in, in, in Danish, that time, that sorrow, that's uh, crossing that bridge when you come to it. Uh, but it's, it kind of has a, a more poetic quality, I think. Um, learning another language uh, is something that uh, gives you um, a new insight onto your own language and um, really um, enriches your, your vocabulary and enriches, you know, even though uh, the Danish language only has uh, a fraction of the words that we have in the English language, but, you know, we have all, uh, you know, we have three versions of every word. You yes. know, we have a Latin version and a French version and an English version. Lots of redundancy in English. Yes, yes. Uh, but, you know, it is a rich language, uh, English. Language is uh, mediated from the bottom up. And, uh, you know, you pick up uh, words in English which did not exist before. Uh, and, you, you know, you're picking up words in, in Danish uh, also, which did not exist before, but not as many. Mm-hmm. It's in a sense, could we make this comparison? Learning another language helps you get a perspective on your own language in a way that living in another society helps you get a perspective on your own society or your native society. You can thus navigate that society better in the same way that you can navigate English better if you learn another language? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you know your society isn't the only one intellectually growing up, and you know your language isn't the only one, but it's something altogether different to then experience that firsthand, right? Yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, it's as important to uh, view uh, your own culture uh, through the lens of another society as from another language. Uh, and once you learn that, uh, that other language and that other culture, um, I think you understand things about your own uh, society and your own culture that you would not have known otherwise. What's something you learned about America in that way? You greet people uh, in, in Europe uh, in order of importance yes. in a room. And I'm, I'm not sure whether that's true uh, in uh, America. But uh, on the other hand, it is true that uh, there is a hierarchy in America. You know, you, you think of America as a classless society, but it's not a classless society. Mm-hmm. What, how is it different then? Because it's certainly not the same in regard to class, nor is it classless. So how is it different from, say, Europe, Denmark, Scandinavia? For one thing, uh, you know, it's the amount of money you have in America. Uh, but it's also, uh, you know, your background, uh, you know, and uh, people... Uh, um, Cling, uh, cling to um, differences, uh, you know, to the daughters of the American Revolution and who came yes. over on the Mayflower. It's all about identity in yes. America. Yes. In, in Denmark, a lot of people have similar identities in that sense, so it's less about that? Well, not less about that, uh, because... You do have, uh, you know, I I can remember my real estate agent who sold uh, my apart my last apartment, 
um, he said, you know, he was uh, kind of a fop, and and he said, do you realize that you have a contessa living upstairs from you? <laughs> and, Did you realize that? No, I didn't realize that, and I was not impressed. <laughs> it didn't mean much to you. you know, no. from, coming from America, the status of countess is not particularly meaningful. Well, uh, you know, maybe it, it, it is meaningful, uh, but uh, I was not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know a little more about... Well, because I've read the first three of the Copenhagen Quartet, as have the, the, the three that are available to American readers, you know what what can we expect from the fourth one? What is what is in Beneath the Neon Egg that is not in the other three? Well, the uh, fourth book is uh, noir because it's uh, set in the winter, and uh, winters are so dark here. And uh, it shows kind of uh, the underbelly of uh, the Danish society, uh, the violence, uh, the the uh, the kind of uh, crime, uh, and the drugs, and the sex. Uh, you know the uh, kind of the sex clubs and Christiania. Uh, you know, it shows another side of Christiania than what I take to be the benevolent side. Right. You know. This is a place that American tourists will hear about. They'll always hear about Christiania. When they read, when they watch videos, they'll say, wow, there's this hippie commune in the center of Copenhagen, right there, steps from Parliament, where he, Bohemians have taken over this military garrison and live just like they want to live. That's true in a sense, but what complicates that mental image that Americans might have of Christiania? In the middle of Christiania, there is a street called Pusher Street. And uh, ha have you been there? I haven't been there yet, maybe not this trip, but it's, it seems essential to understand in Copenhagen that you go to Christiania, ideally with somebody who knows people there, or lives there, or what have you. Well, you can actually go uh, on your own as well. Uh, but, you know, you probably won't see all the, uh, the sites. Uh, but, you know, they sell, um, they have a market, a, a hashish market and a, a marijuana market. And um, the police tried to close it down once. The, the politicians tried to close it down once. And the police uh, were the arm of uh, enforcement of the politicians and um, you know immediately a drug problem uh, appeared in Copenhagen there were shootings in the streets uh, and and so on and so forth uh, you know when uh, the uh, the market the drug market is soft drugs so-called soft drugs uh, when the market is uh, um, uh, centralized in uh, in uh, Christiania, I think that it uh, you know it was a, a, a benevolent thing for society. It's fascinating. I mean, it says something interesting about Danish society, doesn't it? That Christiania is allowed to exist, right? The, the government does not seem particularly interested in stamping it out, do they? Well, they do, uh, you know, because it's prime real estate, and it, it, it is ripe for development, uh, you know, as, you know, high-rise apartments. Uh, and that would be very sad, I think. Don't you think they understand something about how the existence of Christiania is a draw in and of itself, like this is a city where this can exist, therefore the other expensive real estate is more expensive because, hey, I live in a city where there's a hippie commune. Absolutely. Uh, you know, they, they say the, uh, the first uh, tourist uh, attraction uh, is the Little Mer Mermaid, and the second tourist attraction is uh, Christiania. And absolutely, uh, I think 
It, it will be a great loss to Copenhagen if uh, Christiania is closed or in some way interfered with. What are some of the other elements of Copenhagen that you think are indispensable besides Christiania, whether tangible or intangible? What is, What can the city not do without? Well, I think, uh, you, you know, not to harp on uh, this, but uh, the serving houses. Yes, of course. The uh, Vatsus and uh, the squares. Um, you know, you've seen one of them, uh, Kultorvet, the Coal Square, which is uh, right up the street from where we're sitting now, and uh, where uh, the coal used to be delivered. Uh, and that has developed into a, a cafe quarter. Uh, Greyfriars Square, Kolbordertorv, which... Uh, has many uh, restaurants and many benches and uh, an old tree, a uh, 400-year-old tree, uh, New Torvid, the new square, and uh, Gameltorv, uh, the old square, uh, which has, uh, you know, very many uh, cafes and, uh, and they're beautiful. And also the parks. And the sculptures, uh, the the parks are many uh, and vast, um, and they're filled with sculptures, which are financed by Carlsberg Beer, actually, uh, the, the Carlsberg uh, Foundation. And uh, many of them are of, of very old molds uh, of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Roman uh, statues and and so on and so forth. Uh, you, we have a Rodin sculpture of uh, the what is normally called the Thinker uh, in in Copenhagen, and uh, it that's actually uh, a, a depiction of Dante uh, contemplating the sins of uh, that have uh, thrown people into hell. You mentioned to me before that when Bloomsbury, the, the, the large and well-regarded American, well, not just American, their international publisher Bloomsbury, uh, picked up your books, your Copenhagen Quartet, you were then able to convert into a full-time novelist. Tell me about that conversion. Was it because of, the, of Bloomsbury picking up the books, or what, what brought that about? Bloomsbury paid me uh, a good deal of money. Uh, you know, not uh, an enormous amount of money. Uh, it was what I made in two years as a middle manager. Uh, but, you know, having it at one time was, uh, you know, sort of made, uh, made it possible for me to buy an apartment uh, and... Um, I had just broken up with uh, my last duchess <laughs> at the time, and uh, and so I needed to buy another apartment, and just it just came out of the blue, and uh, you know I've lived my life that way. Uh, I've lived my life uh, on on uh, fortune uh, you know and and it's always worked out for me you know I'm not rich but uh, you know it had I, I'm not poor either you know it has always worked out for me it seems to be almost a Copenhagen or a, a Danish way to to exist not at the level of richness not at poverty but to uh, there seems to be some trust of fortune here is there not you know, you have your basic needs taken care of. You have your comprehensive health care. You have uh, free education for your children. You know, uh, otherwise, in the United States, as I understand it, uh, if you have two children that have to go to college, you have to take out a second mortgage on the house. Uh, you know, my kids went to the University of Copenhagen, and, uh, you know, and I didn't have to take out a second mortgage on the house. 
uh, and they actually got a, a small salary uh, for studying because, you know, uh, education is considered a, a social good here. And uh, also, if you're, um, if you're down on your luck, you get a hand up. Uh, so and I think that those three things are uh, a prerequisite for civilization, and I and I think that makes people feel more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Now tell me about that transition. You know, there's lots of listeners to the show who I'm sure are writing, want to become full-time writers, haven't done that yet, haven't been able to. What has it meant to your writing to convert to a writer full-time? Actually, I think I, I got more writing done uh, when I was uh, had a full-time job. <laughs> you knew you were sweating to put out what you needed to put out because you spent 10 hours working. Exactly. And I used to get up uh, a couple of hours before uh, I had to uh, uh, in the morning and before the kids got up. I got up at five and wrote to s till seven or something, and uh, but you know now it's more spread out and uh, it's more uh, comfortable, you know, because I feel that uh, you know if I get an idea for something to write, I can you know I can find the time. And, and that's wonderful. Does Copenhagen remain for you the setting to use? Is it still fruitful even after the, the quartet alone, but more books as well? Is it still is it still rich to you as a setting for fiction? Uh, it is, uh, but I just delivered um, a novel to my agent yesterday, actually, which is set in. Uh, in the Midwest and Long Island, uh, and it's called the Book of Silence, uh, and uh, and he's enthusiastic about it. Uh, Nat Sobel is, and uh, and I'm hoping for that. And the next book uh, I will write is set, uh, which uh, Bloomsbury asked me to write, uh, is set in. Um, uh, in the United States in the 60s uh, during the time that I hitchhiked around. So, you know, uh, Copenhagen is definitely a place where I want to set uh, future work, but uh, America is also, uh, and, you know, other places as well. You know, I've written uh, about various uh uh, milieus, uh, France and uh, Ireland and uh, oh, Switzerland and and so on and so forth. How do Danes who have read your book react to your depiction of Danish life, Danish characters? It must ring true to them on some level. But what have, what have been fascinating responses by Danes to your writing? Well, Danes are uh, react well to stimuli. Stimulus. It's <laughs> always a quality you look for in a people. Yes. And, uh, you know, whereas Americans might be dubious about uh, a critique uh, of American culture, Danes are fascinated by it. It seems like in Scandinavia that is, that is something that happens. You know, the girl with the dragon tattoo books, as I understand, were all about revealing the terrible underbelly of Sweden, and Swedes couldn't get enough. They wanted to hear how bad Sweden was. Is it the same with Danes? They want to hear what might be the problems of our society, or what might be our dark side. I I, I do think that. Uh, you know, I think that um, um, that Danes love to get a take on themselves from American eyes, through American eyes. Specifically American eyes or just foreign well, eyes? Well, through foreign eyes, you know. Uh, in my case, it's American eyes or American, Irish American eyes or French American eyes. Yes, whatever category you want to say. Yeah. But what have they pointed out that is striking to them that you have examined or that you have revealed or observed? Well, they particularly liked uh, that I translated the street names. Uh, 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 
Norwalk Gather becomes Northbridge Street. These are not easy to pronounce, I can assure you, listeners. Exactly. And um, I uh, realized that for the first four or five or six years that I was here, I could not wrap my brain around the street names. So I, I understand. Thought, so I thought, uh, you know, that I would just translate them for for my books. And, you know, I I have uh, I slip in the the Danish names as well. But you know, the the the, the Danes found this hilarious. You know, <laughs> let's not forget you're writing in a country where English is universally spoken. It seems like so every Dane can read your book books without translation. I mean, is that true? Uh, well, you know. The Danes speak uh, English very well, but they, you know, a majority of them uh, are not uh, comfortable with reading. Uh, so you don't need to, really. Yeah. But, you know, I've know, I, I know uh, a lot of uh, young uh, Danish poets and who have not lived in an English-speaking country ever. And when I, when we're sitting around drinking, uh, and my Danish runs dry, they can speak English uh, suddenly, uh, you know, and they swoop right in with the the English, you know. And everybody can be a Danish teacher at that point if you're learning. There's, everybody is able to teach you because they can speak your native language. Absolutely, absolutely. What do you think, let's say, the Americans, America has to learn from a culture like Denmark's, from the way Denmark might regard America or appreciate an American perspective on themselves? You know, what, what would you send back to the homeland that you've learned about uh, that you've learned from living here? I mean, a lot of it is, is embedded in the Copenhagen Quartet, but what... Uh, what do you think you wouldn't have learned had you not lived here? Well, I think I would not have learned the importance of taxes. <laughs> the importance uh, of taxes, interesting. Yeah. With taxes, you build civilization, mm. simply. Um, and, you know, I think uh, that I might have been frightened uh, by the, the word socialism before. But uh, I'm not frightened by it now. Um, and, you know, some of the expressions in, in Danish, like uh, kastasor, sweetheart sorrow, um, that is a, uh, you know, this, this, the sorrow that you feel when a love affair is going wrong is good reason to uh, stay home from work or to stay home from school. That's a horrible excuse. Yes, and or to uh, not uh, deliver a, uh, an assignment uh, in school because you had sweet, sweetheart sorrow. Uh, and I think that's a, a very, very beautiful aspect of the Danish culture and uh, I would recommend it to everyone. The, the idea of socialism has worked out much better here than, say, in the, in the Soviet Union. I mean, what, what about Denmark makes these things work? Is it because it's a small country? Because it's a tight-knit society? What, what, why, do you think the, why do you think a form of socialism works better here than it does in some larger experiments, shall we say? Well, I, I think primarily because it's a democracy, uh, and everyone has a say, and everyone will uh, speak up. Uh, you know, if they think things are are unfair, they will speak up. And uh, you know, I think that's exactly why uh, socialism works here, because uh, you know, I mean, people speak up. Mm. And, you know, they know what they uh, deserve. Right. Yeah. And finally, you know, you, you wouldn't say that 
because this society is content, because it's the happiest country on earth, shall we say, because it is, because it coasts along so smoothly. I mean, clearly, you're a novelist here. You write about Copenhagen. You wouldn't say that eliminates drama, would you? Oh no, uh, certainly not. Uh, I mean, drama is based on, uh, you know, three things: make them laugh, make them weep, make them wait. <laughs> you can do that even in socialism, capitalism, communism, anything, right? Primitive society. You can always do those. Exactly. <laughs> I've been speaking here in one of the illustrious serving houses in the center of Copenhagen, Denmark, with Thomas E. Kennedy, author of many books. But right now in the U.S. and U.K., we're seeing the publication of the Copenhagen Quartet, which would be upcoming, of course, under the beneath, sorry, beneath the neon egg, much more, much more respectable, beneath the neon egg, as well as uh, Kerrigan in Copenhagen in the Company of Angels and Falling Sideways. Thomas, uh, thanks so much for your time. Would, would you like to know the name of the serving house we're in? Sure, let's, let's get this name out. Olsen Gordon's Bodega, which uh, is the place where in 1943, on Hitler's birthday, the uh, a, a Gestapo snitch was liquidated, <laughs> and there's still a bullet hole in the wall. I can assure you, listeners, I've seen this bullet hole. It is real. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. Special thanks to everyone who backed Season 4 on Kickstarter, including Joel Neville Anderson, Daniel Levin Becker, Paige Calvert, Commander Manvark, Jonathan Crow, John Cunningham, David Dawes, James DeVito, Tim Dobbs, Paul Doyle, Jake Elliott, Kevin Emmett, Lawrence English, Jonathan Filbert, Andrew Philippone Jr., Michael Fransky, John French, Themistoclus Eucrucius, Will Graham, Umberto Grant, Samuel Hansen, David Hayes, Jeff Hilnbrand, Mark Hines, Andrew Johnstone, Tadeusz Andre Kodlubowski, Peter Kavanaugh, Ted Kane, Andy Cooney, Evan Landman, Alfred Lee, James Maloney, Sean McDonald, Alberto Bruzos Moro, Jason Miller, Rob Montz, Daniel Murphy, Richard Nash, Aidan Nullman, Patrick O'Flaherty, Danny Olson, Michael O'Regan, Ian Plosker, Christopher Porter, MJ Pritchett, Piers Rippey, Rob Schultz, Todd Shimoda, Cam Smith, Deborah Smith, Adam Sutherland, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Anna Traher, Thomas Interberger, Matt Warren, Nick Wagelt, Dion Wolf, Cynthia Yang, and Wayne Wright. <laughs> <laughs>